Now after the flood, Noah became a husbandman. That means he became a farmer. And he planted a vineyard and he made wine and he got drunk from the wine. And he fell asleep in his tent, naked and exposed. And his son Ham went into the tent and saw him. And so he went out and told his brothers about it. And his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, walked into the tent with a blanket between them without looking. And they walked backwards with the blanket and covered their father up without seeing him naked. And when Noah woke up and found out what had happened, he cursed Ham's son, Canaan. Now, why did he curse Ham's son and not Ham himself? This is the only event recorded of Noah after the flood, even though he lived 350 years after the flood. What it seems to suggest is that since Ham cursed Noah's offspring, who were not yet born, by bringing humiliation upon his manhood, in retaliation, or to save his future offspring, Noah cursed one of Ham's offspring. This curse does play out in the coming generations. This event is the hallmark of Noah's life after the flood. People speculate that Ham did more than just see his father, and that it was sexual things he did with his father, but I disagree. Well, what did he do to get cursed so badly? He must have done something really bad, not just walk in and see him. But actually, it is what he did. He, it's the way he handled it. Um, he should have just covered his father up and not said anything, and nothing ever would have happened. But he went out and told others about his father's humiliation. And this was a great wrong on Noah. When you think about the implications, Noah is the father of all humanity. He is the one in the ark, and his sons are the ones who are going to populate the whole earth. So Ham bringing humiliation upon Noah's progeny is huge. It's like one-third of the earth. He brought humiliation. He, he focused humiliation and the consequences of it upon the grandson and not upon his own sons. It's hard to understand all of this, that Noah shouldn't have been drunk in the first place, or Noah shouldn't have fallen asleep naked in the first place. But this is just the way things happen and the way they play out. That it played out and it became this, like a disease spreading and it had to be stopped. And that's basically what I gleaned from this is that it was an outbreak and it had to stop. And even though maybe Noah could have prevented it by not having wine or there's a million ways it could have been prevented. It wasn't, and it had to be dealt with. People speculate that more was done by Ham than merely seeing Noah naked, but I disagree. In verse 23, Shem and Japheth's saving grace is that they did not see their father naked. They walked into the tent backwards in order not to see him. Ham's offense was not to just see him naked, but to tell his brothers about it, bringing embarrassment upon his father. Let's look at the curse itself. Canaan shall be a servant of servants to his brothers. God shall be the God of Shem. Canaan shall be a servant of Shem. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Canaan shall also be a servant of Japheth. Upon cursing Canaan, Noah pronounced a blessing upon his other two sons. The curse 
is that Canaan becomes a servant of both of the brothers, the one being a servant of the other, and Canaan being a servant even to the servant. Ham does not even get named. He is neither cursed nor blessed. Ham should not have said anything about his father, but just covered him up and left. Instead, he went bringing shame upon him over his body. In response, Noah put shame on his family. He gets forgotten in the blessing, and the son gets cursed. Also, his son Canaan was put on a level with his brothers. His son took his place. In the book of Enoch, Noah's three sons were black, white, and pure red. And out of these three come all the races of the earth. But the table of nations does not seem to suggest that. The ancient Assyrian art suggests that they, as Semites, were brown people. The ancient Egyptian art shows mostly brown people, with some whites, but no pure red people. The ancient Elamites and Arameans were also Semite, but no red people in the Middle East. The Japhethite seemed to be white Indo-Europeans, but the only red people I know are the ginger people from Europe and Native Americans who are called red because when there is interracial families between red and white people, the babies have a high chance of being ginger. Looking at the map through the table of nations, red just does not seem to come into play and neither do the Chinese or the East Asian people. Also, the people of Ham are Arabian and North African. These are not black men like in the Congo or the Australian Maori tribes. These are brown people. So where is the white, black, and red in the table of nations? I don't see it. I see brown people and white people. Genesis seems to me to be a regional understanding for the people of Israel and not a service manual for the entire earth. There is no reason to believe that other cultures who were in no way related to Israel also survived the flood and are simply not mentioned here. In later times, every nation on earth is brought into the controversy and people of every nation, language, and culture are being addressed. But it begins with one nation, the nation of Israel. From my own perspective, this hierarchy of servitude represents something different than race. God is the God of Shem, because out of the Semites came the Jews, and out of the Jews came Jesus Christ, the son of David, who took the throne of Israel. Japheth, who is enlarged, represents the Gentile Christian nations who protect the Jews and the throne of Christ. They are blessed with abundance and they serve Shem and live in his spiritual tent. Canaan represents unbelievers. Through history, this curse was used to justify slavery and serfdom in Europe. Could you imagine in Europe the nobles telling the serfs, we are Shem and you are Ham or Canaan, so you have to serve us, even though they're the same race? And the people believed it because they could not read. They were uneducated. They didn't know anything about the Bible. They couldn't read it. They weren't allowed to read it. The only things they knew was what they were being told by the nobles. There are many things people are told to believe that are in the Bible that actually are not in the Bible. And reading the Bible frees you from a lot of these things. This is spiritual. In order to understand this fully, we must see it play out 
in the history of the Canaanites themselves, an ancient people who are long gone. This Canaanite history is also directly linked to the history of Israel. Now we will discuss the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 to 12, we read, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Ashur, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kala, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kala, the same is a great city. End quote. Nimrod was the third generation after Ham. He would have lived at approximately the same time as Salah, who is the third generation from Shem. Salah was born 37 years after the ark landed. It is fair to say that Nimrod was born within a hundred years after the flood. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 again. In episode 2 we covered this verse quite extensively. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 we read, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. End quote. The use of the term mighty is the same Hebrew word used for Nimrod, the mighty hunter. It's also, this, wor this word is also used by Moses to describe God as mighty. And it was also used by Joshua to describe his own warriors. They were mighty warriors. The word itself, of itself, has no implication other than the word mighty. The only information we can glean from this is that Nimrod founded four cities in the land of Shinar, which is Sumer. These cities are Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. As we translate from Hebrew to Sumerian, Babel refers to the city of Babylon. Erech refers to the city of Uruk. Akkad is Akkad. The city of Akkad has been lost since it was destroyed during the fall of the Akkadian kingdom. Kalna has been identified by classical history as the Mound of Nippur in Iraq. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 10 to 26, we find the genealogy of Abraham beginning with Shem all the way down to Abraham with dates since the flood. Chapter 11 of Genesis explains to us how the earth was divided during Peleg's time and Nimrod was probably reaching his prime when Peleg was born. Nimrod is the third generation from Ham, while Peleg is the fourth generation from Shem. This is about the Tower of Babel, which is how Babylon began, being founded by Nimrod. The tower was made of baked bricks and was likely used to build the city of Babylon after it fell into the great city it once was. God had told Noah to multiply and fill the earth, but Nimrod's idea was the opposite of God's. He said, let us build a great city and a tower and let us make a great name lest we be scattered. And so God confounded their languages and the earth was divided. And God made the eating of game acceptable for the first time after the flood. He put the fear of man into the animals, and Nimrod became a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is L-O-R-D, all caps. That means 
His great name was the Mighty Hunter before Jehovah. Before is not used in the sense of ahead of, in this case. It is used as in front of. Nimrod was a mighty hunter in the face of Jehovah. This could mean he was sanctioned by Jehovah, or he was challenging Jehovah. He did end up challenging Jehovah's plan by building the Tower of Babel. They were advancing too fast and not in obedience to the command given to Noah. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, we read, Out of that land went forth Ashur, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Calah, and Rezin between Nineveh and Calah, the same as a great city. End quote. It seems that Nimrod's city building in Shinar caused Assur to seek higher ground. Assur left Lower Mesopotamia and built Nineveh on the Tigris River, and Calah, which is the ruins in Iraq called Nimrud, which was recently damaged by the Islamic State occupiers. Rehoboth and Rezin have not yet been located. This gives us a bird's eye view of the beginnings of Babylon and Assyria, who become the first two of the great empires. Nimrod is still unknown to history. He was a mighty hunter, a hunter of game that is, and sanctioned by Jehovah because he allowed hunting. This empire of Babylon ends up becoming the evil empire against God and his people in later times. This is the very beginnings of it, that it took gods adapting the world from pre-flood to post-flood by saying, okay, I will allow you to eat meat and I will put the fear of you into the animals. So Nimrod takes full advantage of this adaptation and becomes a mighty hunter before Jehovah and leads God's people astray from Jehovah's plan. So this is the the beginnings of the evil empire. Somewhere on a dusty shelf in a museum basement is the story of Nimrod carved on a clay tablet, but it is not yet cataloged. Nobody has ever translated it. Until then, Nimrod will remain somewhat of a mystery to us. In our next episode, we will look at Father Abraham. We'll see you then.